<clears throat> We're starting a new series. I'm starting a new series from the chapter of, or the Gospel of John in John 17. So if you would turn to that, I'll be reading uh, verses 1 through 5. So if you'd rise, please, if <clears throat> I can keep my voice. John <clears throat> chapter 17. I will be focusing on verses 1 and 2 today, but I'd like to read verses 1 through 5. This is the living, inner word of God. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Father, we thank you for giving us this prayer of your Son as he prayed to you. Help us to learn from it. Help us to be rejoicing that you continually pray for us. Help us to learn and obey, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So this chapter in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, is called the High Priestly Prayer by many people, uh, many commentaries. Uh, But it's called, uh, it has other titles. Uh, For example, uh, besides the High Priestly Prayer, which is the most common, it's also called the Intercessory Prayer of Our Lord. The Intercessory Prayer of Our Lord. Charles Spurgeon called it Christ's Pastoral Prayer for His People. His Pastoral Prayer for His People. And in this beautiful prayer, the Lord Jesus is praying to His Father in Heaven. He's praying for Himself in the beginning, for His disciples uh, there and for us, and for all of His own, there, then, and now. He is interceding for His own. He's interceding for us. And this should greatly encourage us, brothers and sisters, to try to even conceive that our Lord is praying for us. And also, this I believe, I pray, would be a blessing to help us as we have been praying, to learn how to pray, to look at how our Lord prayed to his Father and learn from that. And dear family, we are part of this prayer. The part that I read, the part I didn't read, we are part of this prayer. He is praying for us. We are on his heart. And the Lord is interceding for us now. Romans 8, 34. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Hebrews 7, 25. He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. There is one God and one man, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Praise God. We have an intercessor, continual intercessor, and we have a mediator the living Son of God. Now, a better understanding of this prayer, I believe, and of the one who loves us and died for us and prayed this for us and is praying this for us should change us. I'm praying that it will change us. It's already changed me. And as I thought of preaching through or going through a series on this psalm, I realized that that it isn't so much the the words that are here. Uh, Some of them are fairly short and easy to comprehend in that way. But they're very deep. We're trying to understand the Trinity, basically, here. And it should move us to prayer. I believe it will. And to praise the Lord Jesus that we have, that he has such a great love for us. And we see in this his example of going to the Father and pouring out his heart as he did. And of the unity of the Father and the Son, which is the unity that we have, is why we can be unified. And this is seen every week. This unity is seen every week in this table. And there are many deep things here. And as J.C. Ryle stated, he said, uh, that could hardly be otherwise. Because he said, the one who reads the words spoken by one person of the Blessed Trinity to another person in the Trinity, by the Son to the Father, 
must surely be prepared to find much that he cannot fully understand. And I feel woefully inadequate. So may the Lord use me through this series. This prayer can be divided up <clears throat> just basically in several ways. But uh, Basically, in the first five verses, the Lord Jesus is praying to the Father, communing with his Father. The, the uh, uh, saints are hearing him, the disciples are hearing him. And he is rejoicing in their relationship together. And he's rejoicing in the unique roles that they have and seeking to glorify the Father. He was always seeking to glorify the Father with his words and his work. And then he prays <clears throat> for those who are his own, his disciples. In general, verses 6 through 10, these are kind of general uh, prayers for the disciples. And then in 11 through 16, uh, that we, who are his by purchase of blood, that we might be kept, that we might be preserved in unity of faith, that we might be preserved from evil in the evil one. And then verses 17 through 19, that we would be sanctified by his word. And then for the whole church at the end, that we might be united perfectly as are the Father and the Son, and that we might see his glory and be glorified. All that is in there. And it'll probably take four months or five months maybe to go through this slowly. This prayer is right after a very long sermon by the Lord Jesus. And he gave that sermon. It was uh, chapters 14 through 16 of the Gospel of John. Uh, much of it was about the coming spirit, the comforter. So he gave this sermon, and then immediately after that, it says, uh, or well, Matthew Henry said this of, uh, about that. He said, when he had spoken from God to them, he turned to speak to God for them. So he gave this lengthy sermon, and then he lifted up his eyes, it says, and he prayed. Now in chapter 16, as Jesus said to them, to help them begin to understand, he said, a little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. And then a little later, he said, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he is giving his disciples right then and then through this prayer comfort, great comfort and hope, even in the coming tribulation that he told them they would have as he is about to be killed. And yet he declares that he has overcome the world. And he had already promised to send the Comforter and the Holy Spirit to be their helper. And then after he finished praying here for them, immediately they go to Gethsemane, where he is betrayed and he's arrested and he's killed. He's crucified for us. Now he is aware, the Lord Jesus is aware of the shame and the agony ahead <clears throat> for him. But he's also aware of the glory and he knows about the cross. He knows about the crown also that awaits him. And he begins by praying to his Father. And we learn again here of the divinity of our Lord Jesus and his relationship with his heavenly Father. And in this prayer, the Lord Jesus shows he is equal with God, the Father, in power and in glory. And verse 1 says, Jesus spoke these words. He gave his sermon, the word from the Father to his people. And it said, then he lifted up his eyes to heaven in other words, he lifted up his soul. He poured out his heart to his Father in prayer. And this is what the Lord has given us to study and learn from. As we seek to do, we seek to do this during worship, we seek to do this as we come to the table. And the Lord is our example in prayer. Praise God that he's given us this example also. And he's our example in all things. Charles Spurgeon said, he poured out his soul in life. He did that by giving the word and by praying. He, he said he poured out his soul in life before he poured it out unto death. Jesus is pouring out his heart and his life for his people. Still, he is interceding for us. And his disciples heard him pray this way to his father. And he began, Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. So his appointed time to die for his own, meaning those who were given to him by the father, the appointed time of his sacrifice had come, and this was agreed upon at, in the council of the Godhead before time. And so this is that perfect time. 
And he was asking the Father to glorify himself, to glorify the Father also, to enable him to drink this cup he was about to drink, and to glorify the triune God by his death, by his obedience in death, and his, by his resurrection and by his ascension to heaven. And it's so joyful for us, it should be so joyful. For we should be overjoyed as children of the living God to see the delight that the Father and the Son have in bringing glory to each other. What a wonderful picture to see their love for one another and to see their grace and their giving hearts in their relationship. And then the Lord Jesus prayed to his Father, glorify your Son, that your Son may, glorify, may also glorify you. John Calvin stated that Christ asks this, that his kingdom may be glorified in order that he also may advance the glory of the Father. The Lord Jesus was always seeking the glory of his Father. Asking that the Father would glorify His Son was to ask that the true nature of the Son's divinity would be more fully displayed. It, it had been veiled when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And He's asking that it would be glorified. Verse 2 says, As you have given Him authority over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as you have given Him. Now the word give, or the word given, is given here 14 times. I probably should recount it. Uh, maybe more. In other words, in these, the number of these verses, more than every other verse, that the word give or given is used. It's a key word, in other words, and I will focus on that through this series. And it shows the loving and the giving relationship between the Father and the Son, and the equality in their love for the elect, their love for us. The Father and the Son were giving glory to each other. And we will look at what that me means again. Uh, through this uh, series. Now here, our, it says, our Lord was given all authority over all people by his Father, and the Lord Jesus is able to give eternal life to those who were given to him. In this same gospel, in chapter 6, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So the Lord was given authority over all flesh, over all people. And because of that authority, he is able to give eternal life to as many as the Father gave to him from eternity and for eternity. He is sovereign in redemption. Brothers and sisters, he is sovereign in our salvation. And in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas told the Gentiles, and they were so overjoyed when they heard this, that the gospel also came to them. And at the end of that, it said in chapter 13, verse 48, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. It's passive. As many as had been appointed to eternal life believe at that point. The atonement was limited to the elect. It is particular, if you'd rather use that word, to his people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Praise God. Our Lord spoke intimately here with his Father, with whom he had a perfect relationship, equal in power and glory, and he spoke in the hearing of his disciples and also for us now that they and we might see the relationship between the Father and the Son and rejoice in the unity of the Father and the Son, which also unifies all of those who are in him. So the three persons of the Godhead enjoy such close fellowship that they mutually indwell each other. And I remember one of the questions that in my ordination exam was something about the Trinity that totally blew me away. I, almost, I couldn't hardly almost say anything because it's incomprehensible. But I tried, of course. Uh, but they mutually indwell each other. I didn't know that phrase at that point. I wish I had. But even that is incomprehensible. There's a term that I might explain later. It's called perichoresis, but it means they mutually indwell each other. They are one. And the Lord is praying that the Father would be glorified in his life and in his death. Al Albert Barnes, in his commentary uh, of this request of the Lord Jesus to his Father, said, uh, glorify your Son is basically uh, asking honor your Son. And he goes on, he says, Give to the world demonstration that I am your son. So sustain me, and so manifest your power in my death and resurrection and ascension as to afford indubitable evidence that I am the son of God. That is what he's saying when he says, Glorify me. And dear people of God, the Father and the Son have chosen us to glorify them. Now, even as we come to this table, to glorify them by the Spirit, of course, and by faith. Much has been given to us, dear people, because our Lord 
when he came to the time determined in the Godhead, he sacrificed himself for us, which we remember, praise God, each week here. And so may the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be glorified in our hearts, dear people, as we partake of this. And may our hearts be full of praise and adoration and thanksgiving. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come as yours by purchase of blood, as your children. And we rejoice and we give thanks that you chose us in Christ, in love, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before you, having predestined us to adoption as sons, as children by Jesus Christ to himself. O oh, Father in heaven, what a joyful truth we have here and a blessed calling to be yours by your goodness and the grace of your Son. Lord, we thank you that each week we are reminded of your loving sacrifice for us and your perfect relationship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our adoration and our obedience. And so we come, and we come humbly with awe and fear because we could not save ourselves. And we also come joyfully, Lord, because you did save us. And you are our mediator and our continual intercessor. And so we praise you and we come in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.